well, hello and welcome to uh, today's CRF webinar on the topic of strategies for downsizing with compassion and care. My name is Gillian Pillins, Research Director at Corporate Research Forum, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ian Hunter from Bird and Bird, JC Townend from LHH, and Julie, Julianne Keeble from Honda. So really the purpose of today's session is um, to look at, uh, as across, across different geographies, government schemes are, are starting to come to an end as we progress through the coronavirus crisis. And we're starting to see the fallout, um, the economic fallout of, uh, of what's, what's been happening over the last six months. So as HR professionals, we need to be prepared um, to manage the, the, the uh, job reductions that, that we might expect to play out over the rest of the year and into, into next year. In a, in a compassionate and effective manner. So really the purpose of this session is to, to discuss some of the practical considerations around managing redundancies, how we in our organizations can, can, um, can do that best and really treat our people fairly um, and uh, achieve the best possible outcome, both in terms of being fair to those who are leaving our organizations, but also to maintain the, the commitment, motivation and engagement of those who, who stay. So we'll be coming at this topic from, from multiple angles. We'll be looking at practical case study from, from Honda and also looking at um, some of the, the risks associated with, with getting this wrong. So um, I'm sure you're all familiar with, with Zoom um, these days. Um, we want to, for those of you who haven't been on a CRF webinar before, we like to make these as interactive as possible. So do please use the chat. Uh, raise your hand if, um, like to make if you're not speaking, if you can keep on mute um, uh, to avoid any background noise. Um, just to say we will also be recording this session and we will be sending both the video recording and summary notes uh, to, to all attendees uh, after the, the event. Um, so that will be available to you. Um, I think that pretty much covers it. Without further ado, can I hand over now to, to Ian? Um, so Ian, the, the exam question we set you is, you, you know, you've, you've led and guided many organisations through these kind of situations. So it'd be great if you could share a little bit about um, what you see as the common sort of pitfalls and risks of uh, managing redundancy programmes and uh, what are some of the practical steps that we can take to avoid um, getting, uh, getting tripped up. So over to you, Ian. That's very kind of you, Gillian. Thanks very much. And gosh, I guess I've been doing handling redundancies for about 30 odd years now. Um, I know you're all thinking my, with my boyish good looks, how could that possibly be the case? But it's, it's true. And I suppose looking at the, the title here, handling redundancies with compassion, I mean, goodness, I would have thought at a human level, that's something we, we would all be, we would all aspire to. But in my experience, there are a couple of good commercial reasons as to why that's the approach you could take. In my experience, probably two major problems that come with a badly handled uh, redundancy process, whether it's collective or individual. I think, first of all, you end up with legal and administrative problems often, and I'm sure you're all familiar with DSAR applications, which are often a, a sign of frustration with a process. On the, on the part of the employee. And of course, the second thing is if it's handled badly, you can end up with long-term resentment, both with remaining employees and those who've departed. So you can end up with a talent retention and talent attraction problem. So look, what I thought I'd do would just share a, a few, few ideas that I've picked up over the years on the battlefield. And, and I am very much aware that one size fits all strategy can be quite difficult can be quite difficult i appreciate people are operating in different sectors aviation and hospitality is is, obvi is obviously having a much more difficult economic time than potentially people in the telecoms or in in, in the life science sector but anyway here goes here here are a few things to, perhaps to take away i suppose the first thing whether you're dealing with collective or individuals, is remembering that you're dealing with individuals and that everybody's different and that you need to, once you've looked at the legal side, you need to apply your strategy to the individuals. So some employees will be frightened, some will be depressed, others will be angry. Um, and much will depend with the individual on, in my experience, how likely they are to find future employment quickly. What does the future look like? 
But think about the individual. Are they a confrontational person? Are they realistic? Are they fatalistic? What does, their, what does their partner think? Is their partner more difficult? Are they following them? Do they have friends, dare I say it, who are either lawyers or HR directors who may be able to give them some input? Do they have the resolve and do they have the resources to fight? All worth feeding into the computer as you try to work out how you're going to, to deal with it. I think the second thing as well is in terms of trying to make it go smoothly is are you able to confidently and transparently rationalize the reasons why you're going to make those redundancies? And of course, we've all seen the great, the, the great approach from the, the Airbnb CEO. Because in my experience, employees find it a lot easier to manage if they think there's an economic rationale for why they're going rather than something to do with their personal performance. It's easier for them as individuals to explain to themselves and to other people. Now, of course, that can be much easier to do if you're closing a complete site down, if you're closing a plant, if you're leaving a particular country or you're moving your operations to a low cost jurisdiction where everybody's going. Where it can become more problematic is when you're simply reducing the size of the workforce and therefore you need to create pools in, in order to decide who's going and who's not going. And again, there's, it's well worth giving thought to the selection criteria. In my experience, again, the more objective you can make it, the easier it is for the employee to understand. The less subjective, the less debate you have. So again, thinking about that quite carefully can often be important. I fully appreciate that when you're trying to get a balanced workforce, you may need a selection criteria that gets you to where you're going. But within those constraints, it's well worth uh, trying to approach it on that basis. Probably one of my biggest uh, pieces of advice, choose carefully who's going to manage the process. Um, who, who's going to have those conversations? Are they a trustworthy individual? Do they have the right competencies? Are they connected with the, with the decision-making process? And again, if you're looking, for example, at board level terminations, and many of you will be familiar with those, in my experience where it goes badly is where the CEO decides they want to get rid of somebody on their main board group, but they decide they're not going to deliver that message. Um, even if they were involved in recruiting the individual and they decide to outsource those awkward conversations to someone like one of you who's listening on this call. And then that's often when I see things going, going wrong, the, the, the individual can, be, uh, can end up being very angry and, 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 and the whole process becomes more difficult, as I said. You end up with legal and administrative problems you might have been able to avoid. So think carefully about who's going to do that. And then, of course, how are you going to handle those meetings themselves? Um, how they're conducted? Are you properly prepared? Do you have the scripts ready? Does everybody know what they're doing? Do you have the documentation ready? And of course, we now have the additional problem with the COVID-19 position. You may end up having to deal with these things by way of, of Zoom calls rather than face-to-face. -face. So again, tailoring the process as much as possible to reduce the amount of, of disruption. Next thing, particularly if you're looking at collective, collective consultations, have you got sufficient resources and have you planned the process properly? In my experience, often people outside that process can make the business decision to do something the UNHR are there under the pressure to try and uh, sort things out quickly. Remember, the employees are likely to be very unsettled if you're doing something like this, particularly if you're doing a redundancy process at high speed. So it's very important before you kick off that process that you've done all of your groundwork, that you've got your communication process right. So if you're doing a collective process, have the FAQs been, who's going to do the FAQs? If you're going to have meetings with trade unions or employee reps, have you got people lined up who are able to come back quickly and manage the process, keep the whole thing moving? What are you gonna do about the employees placed at risk? Are you sending them home? Are you keeping them in the office? Have you thought through what happens if they start talking to those who are staying there? Have you thought through all of the disruption that might occur? Do you have enough HR and legal support 
available to manage everything that you've been asked to do. So we had a situation where the business, it was actually the decision was taken in the US to make 150 people redundant, most of whom had protection against unfair dismissal. So we ended up thinking we're going to have to do roughly three meetings for each, for each individual. Do we have enough people to do that? Well, we've got three people. Well, that's going to be difficult. So again, working through, making sure you've got the right resources. Do the employees know how to accept an offer? If it's given to them, how will all of that process work? Um, try and avoid divide and rule. So what I often find happening at a senior board level, a senior director goes, someone, perhaps an HR is handling the process, but they decide to go and lobby their other friends on the board to see if they can get a better deal. The whole thing then becomes confused so make sure you know who's, who's in control, the employee knows in control, and so that there's no divide and rule. Um, have you contingency planned if things start to go wrong, particularly doing a mass redundancy? Have you thought through the things that could go wrong and are you ready to deal with that? Do you have PR lined up? So again, when we do cross-border uh, structurings, we often have difficulties in places like France where they are local uh the local mayor become involved the local press the po the local politicians have you lined up and thought how you might manage those sorts of situations and my last one i suppose to think about is focusing on how you can help the employee what i do when i'm acting for senior executives i always say to them listen what you need to do is not look back look forward and i think it's the same when you're trying to help employees trying to encourage them to look to the future rather than, than, rather than the past. Now look, everybody's going to have different financial resources available. Some sectors are hit harder than others. Employees will have different legal and statutory rights. Some of them will have contractual redundancy policies and there'll be things in law that you need to follow. But what else can you do to help those employees? So the sort of things to think about if you're a listed company, are there options? that you could uh, give them the discretion to, 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 to exercise and take with them. Can you give them a reference? That's again, an important thing. Could you hand over the mobile phone and the laptop? Very important when people are looking for other jobs as they go forward. If they've got restrictive covenants, is that something that you could lift to help them find another job? They've got healthcare, often that's a main concern for people. Normally with health healthcare policies, they need to be renewed once a year. So the employee can stay on that policy till the renewal date. Again, cost the employer nothing, but it's a sign of goodwill and thought that you've put that in place for the employees. And then finally, um, think about supporting uh, outplacement to support the individual going forward. Hopefully I've done that, Gillian, roughly within time, not counted too far over, but, but I'll pause so we can take questions at the end or whatever works for you. So yes. thank you all for listening to me. It was a quick run through, but I hope it was helpful. Thank, thanks, Ian. Uh, that was really, really practical. And, um, you know, I think hopefully will be really helpful to, to people. I mean, you know, one of the things that really struck me about what you said is that sometimes the things that make most difference are not the most expensive. And, and I think we'll be coming back to that um, uh, through the, the course of this session. Um, we'll, we'll pause for a second if you have, if anyone has any questions or please also feel, feel free to share any stories that, that you would like to share of your own experience and, and please you know, do that in the chat or feel free to, um, to, to bring yourself off, off mute to, um, to, to share that. But um, while you're, you're perhaps pondering any questions that you might have for Ian, one thing just to point out Ian is that you've put together a, a very practical guide a document uh, uh, that covers various jurisdictions um, that uh, we, we will be sharing uh, after this session so um, you know that there's lots and lots of really useful practical uh, tips in there but also uh, for those we, we've kept this general because we're we're conscious that, that people on the call will be um, in different uh, geographies but um, there's much more specific information about different jurisdictions in that document that we'll be sharing later Okay, so we'll come back. We'll have more time for questions as we as we go through the the, uh, uh, the the webinar as well. What we'd like to do now is really turn to a very practical example of um, of how some of these challenges played out in practice. So delighted to have Julie Julianne Keeble from from Honda here. Um, 
Honda has um, a long history of manufacturing in, in the UK at, at a factory in, in Swindon. Um, but um, there's, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to Julie to, to tell the story, but there's a, a huge amount of change going, going on there over a number of, a, a multi-year uh, project. And um, there's some really fantastic lessons learned from, from how you've handled that whole um, situation, Julie. So I'll, I'll hand over to you to, to share, um, share the Honda story and the, the key lessons learned. Thank you. Great, thanks Gillian. I'm going to share my screen. I've got some slides to share with you. So I'm hoping that this will uh, work and go to plan. If you could let me know when you can see my screen, that would be great. Yep, all good. Great, thank you. Just trying to get it to go on to presentation mode. Here we go. So um, thank you for inviting me to um, share um, the uh, Honda of the UK manufacturing um, story, which is, is still underway. As Julian's mentioned, it's a, a multi-year project. Um, uh, I've got a little bit of an introduction for you in terms of who Honda of the UK manufacturing are. Um, we, we, we call ourselves HUM, which is a bit of a strange one to be used to, but I'll refer to that through the presentation and um, possibly um, I'll fall into that colloquial language. So there with me if I do. Um, so I'll quickly move on. Um, I've got a, a video um, to play um, and uh, it gives an impression um, of uh, what it's like to work on the site and a few key facts. So um, uh, in the absence of having sound um, for that video I'll, I'll talk over some of the key points as we go through. So um, as Gillian mentioned, we've been in existence in Swindon for over 30 years and have grown significantly from when the, the first turf was dug until, um, until the uh, closure, which will be next year. So I'll play the video and I'll do some talk over for you. So this video is a very brief introduction which we use um, in our reception building normally when our um, offices and factory are uh, open as normal. So as it uh, says, we are a fully integrated car manufacturing facility. So um, uh, the, there's very little that comes in built. It's all built on site. This gives you a, a view of what it looks like to work in the factory um, and see some of the technical um, and automation, uh, technical abilities that are needed of our associates and also the automation that's in place as well. So essentially this shows our site which is actually an ex airfield um, and the first plant to set up was engine followed by car plant one and car plant two which sadly was um, decommissioned um, in the last financial crisis. So the first turf was dug in 1985 and within 12 months we were doing inspections of engines for Rover um, at the time. Um, but very quickly um, after that, we moved into making our own engines because there was capacity um, on site to do that. So in 1992, um, the car plant one became fully operational and we began producing the Honda Accord, which some of you may or may not know. It's not um, available in the UK anymore, but we went on to produce a number of different models uh, right through and including the um, Civic Type R. And in 2015, we celebrated the production of our three million um, car. Um, in January coming, we would um, have achieved um, four million um, cars. So we're not the biggest um, factory in the UK but certainly um, producing quite a number of vehicles. So that was just a very brief introduction for you. I hope that was helpful to just give you a little bit of insight into um, what it's like and the history of the site that actually is now closing. Let me take you through what that timeline looks like. So the uh, closure, um, uh, proposal closure announcement came in February last year when Honda Motor, um, our parent company based in Japan, announced a global restructuring of all of its manufacturer, manufacturing operations and um, its proposal therefore to close the Swindon site. Um, confirmation of that came in July 2019. So we had quite an unsettled period between February and uh, July because um, there was quite a lot going on to try and see what could be done uh, both from a national task force perspective and from a, a local union perspective to, um, to stop that closure happening and, and, and to try and save the, save the plant. Um, the production won't cease um, until um, July next year so there's um, a two-year period between that confirmation of site closure and the production actually ceasing. 
Um, uh, the business will continue for a period thereafter until July 2022, um, but that's really about decommissioning of site and, and going into the um, handing over to liquidators. So for most associates, there's been um, over a two year period of notification that they're uh, being made redundant. Um, and I say, I say it like I'm not one of those, but, but obviously I am. Um, so um, moving on, what I wanted to do was share um, some of the challenges that we have. Now, some of the challenges we have, I think, um, are common. So I think that the scale of the, 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 the closure is quite unique to, to many, um, but the challenges are quite common. So I think just referring back to what Ian was saying, um, a number of these resonate. So obviously maintaining that associate motivation and retaining those associates for that two year period has, has, has been a major focus for us, particularly when we're seeking to protect the product quality um, and, and working in, in a complex uh, manufacturing um, business and, and with complex processes. We also had um, multiple stakeholders, um, which I think will be the same. There might be different stakeholders, but um, multiple stakeholders to manage. So our, our, our Japanese parent company, the National Task Force, which was set up by the government in response to the closure. Um, uh, we're unionized and also within the supply chain and the eco um, socioeconomic impact thereof. Many of the people, many of the organizations in the supply chain are affiliate Honda businesses. Um, we have a long serving, highly skilled workforce, so many of our associates are 25, 30 years service, only ever worked in the, in the car factory and their, their skills are not necessarily easily redeployable. Um, like many, most recently we've had to adapt to virtual delivery um, and uh, have had to communicate a lot of detailed information to a very large workforce, which has been a challenge for us. And um, securing buying an investment, and particularly for us, this was about securing uh, buying an investment and an understanding from our, our Japanese parent company of what we needed to do to support our associates in, in, in this instant, and then more, more so locally. Um, um, in terms of the investment to um, to provide support to our associates. So um, what it's done for us is been able to allow us that two years has allowed us to create a really comprehensive support program and agree a number of principles. So. Um, Essentially, the associates are a top priority. We've we've said that for you know we it's easy to say we're we're demonstrating that through what we're doing. Um, we've been um, very careful in terms of which partners we engage with um, to make sure that they're aligned to um, what we're trying to achieve and the level of support. That everything that we provide is available to all. It's relevant. It's accessible. That we're supporting our managers and our leaders, um, and also that we're continuing to monitor and understand um, and temperature check in with. Um, our our associates on um, how they're feeling. So what that led us to do is create a multifaceted support program, which we call our associate support program. And there are four pillars to um, the program, which you can see here: well-being, career transition, training and development, and financial and retirement planning. So we tried to make it a very comprehensive investment and um, where we're prioritizing our associates and showing them that we we care um, and implementing these with some compassion. So the well-being support, we partnered with their first. Many of you may have. Um, already have EAP schemes in place. Um, there was the 24-7 um, helpline, which we've continued to advertise. But in addition, we had drop-in sessions, on-site counsellors. We've um, uh, expedited our mental health first aiders uh, training, and we've um, instigated a number of additional wellbeing events. It's something we already did, but we've targeted those slightly differently. For career transition, we have partnered with LHH. We have a full suite of um, support available to associates um, and we've done a lot of manager and associate briefings. I'm going to come on to say more about this, um, this one in, in, in a moment. Training and development opportunities. Um, here we partnered with local colleges and the local task force. So um, a lot of work with the local task force who report into the national task force, um, which is typical in the situation where you have such scale of redundancies. We implemented resilient training and um, I could give you a whole nother presentation on um, what we're doing on training and retraining. Um, I would be more than happy um, if people wanted to contact me to share a little bit more information about what we're doing there. 
And then for, for time, retirement and financial planning, uh, we've partnered with Deloitte and Ren Sterling to support with um, independent financial advice appointments for every associate, um, pension workshops, and also lots of online training that's targeted at every associate regarding of what age they are and whether they're planning to retire or not, just to give them that um, financial um, uh, and retirement planning um, input. So that ultimately what the message here is that it's a comprehensive rounded um, package rather than solely focused in one area and it's about not just saying we care but showing that we care um, um, by investing in this to, um, so our associates can see and feel that. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the career transition side um, because um, it would take me a good couple of hours to go across all of the areas. So as I've mentioned, we partnered with LHH. We've um, made everything as relevant and accessible as possible and made it available to all. And this is really about making sure that we are preparing and are uh, equipping our associates as much as we can for life after Honda. So the um, activities that you see listed here goes right through from um, having an on-site career transition centre, which again, I'll come on to give you more information about that in a second. Everybody um, had um, the opportunity to attend a briefing session. Um, everyone's had um, the opportunity to attend a diagnosis, um, a diagnostic session already with a career coach. We're now um, having, um, since come back from lockdown, we've now relaunched the workshops and the um, uh, further um, career coaching sessions and people can have up to another five. So what's... Um, uh, what we're doing um, essentially is trying to take our associates to market so rather than um, uh, giving them this information and make it uh, allowing them to have that access and allowing them to have that support what we're also trying to do is take them to market by being um, uh, engaging and LHH are our partner with this engaging with as many different employers as possible that could be recruiting for the skills that our associates have so we're focusing um, on uh, targeting employers um, having um, very focused um, events utilizing the digital talent exchange um, and above all one of the things that's been really helpful in working with the task force is understanding what the local um, employment market looks like what the outlook looks like so we've engaged with them in terms of understanding what the industrial looks like at a local level but also understanding what the likely investment is from other companies in the area what skills they'll be needing so that we can feed that into the um, career transition support but also our retraining offering so I um, mentioned the career transition center we're very proud of this um, unfortunately it's closed right now for obvious reasons but what um, you can see uh, here on the left hand side is that what we tried to create was a space that people could just drop in um, to um, speak to LHH they were on site it, there was it was um, it, it was all it was open for 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 every day, um, typical office hours and sometimes for shift, uh, shift workers as well. Um, it is closed at the moment, but I think what's been um, positive um, about that having been open for some months was that um, people got an opportunity to engage with um, the LHH uh, team and um, therefore feel more uh, comfortable um, uh, calling and, and virtual dropping to those um, to those individuals now. Um, on the right, you can see that we had we had a very um, successful employer event. So we've had some associates that have left us um, right through from August last year through to September um, this year already. And for those individuals, we did a targeted employment event where they were only invited, and it gave an opportunity for ten companies who were recruiting for the specific skills that we had. Um, the associates leaving had um, and um, from that there's been a number of successful appointments for those associates so that's been um, um, uh, really positive but the key thing for us if you can bear in mind that many of the long-serving associates wouldn't have um, done a CV for a number of years had an interview for a number of years worked anywhere else potentially actually entering into this sort of environment and having these sorts of conversations was something that was quite alien to them so we needed to make it as comfortable as possible so um, just a little bit of, um, of feedback that we've had. So um, in terms of our successes, um, the introductory uh, briefing, we had a 99% attendance of our associates. So 99% of our associates attended um, an hour long briefing to share the um, uh, 
associate support um, information. 96% um, then followed up and have had initial one-to-one -one career coaching session. And for those that have attended workshops, we've had a really positive 4.5 out of 5 score for the workshop. So um, we're continuing to get positive feedback. I won't go through all of these. It's just to give you a flavour that... Um, uh, what, what's been important to us is, is in, uh, an LHO is an example of one of our partners that we select to partners that are aligned to our approach, our approach and if it's part of our decision making that we wanted people that were um, understanding of our environment and could work with that environment and the challenges that it brings. So it's really about making sure that people felt comfortable accessing the service and that they got reassurance and they felt um, that they could um, ask the questions that they needed to, even if they um, were very basic questions. So what are we learning? So clearly we're still in the uh, process. Um, what have we learned? So um, we learned there'll be surprises. We've had a couple. We've had COVID, which is the obvious one, but we've, we've also had um, uh, nice surprises along the way as well in terms of um, the, the, the smooth um, partnership that we've had with our union. Um, we, we've had press leakage, um, which we've had to deal with. Um, one of the ones that's been interesting for us is, is the length of the denial stage that we've had from some of our associates. So because it isn't happening immediately and it's some way off, associates are um, uh, up until very recently, we've still had quite a number of people in there. This isn't happening. This isn't going to happen stage. So that's been um, a, 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 you know, uh, something that we didn't expect. Maintaining pace with multiple stakeholders has been a challenge. So um, particularly where those uh, organisations may not necessarily be used to working in, with, with business um, at, at a pace um, that, that, that certainly Honda like to work at. So that's been a challenge for us. Encouraging associates to access the support. So this is a little bit aligned with the denial stage, but also just making it as comfortable as possible for, for associates to engage in what's available to them. Um, media engagement, so obviously it has generated a lot of media interest um, and um, I guess the lesson learned there is um, about us probably being more proactive um, and supporting with more positive messaging out rather than just waiting to be reactive. Um, well-being of the HR community, so we've all been really busy, we worked all through lockdown when the majority of the um, associates were furloughed um, and uh, yeah just being mindful that actually we need to look after ourselves as well. And then the final one, leadership visibility. Um, it's, it's a challenge for us in our working environment for that. Um, but And also given the COVID situation, that doesn't help. But even if you think your leadership visibility is very good, um, I'd encourage you to think about increasing that as much as possible um, it, uh, when, uh, when redundancies are, or even consultation is underway. Um, it, it's been um, an interesting one for us to, um, to work through. And we recognise there's going to be more um, to come. So as my final um, uh, information just to share with you, I just wanted to kind of start to give a, um, to start to show what we're seeing as some of the positives. So we still have a really constructive union partnership with our local convenience. That's that that that's. Um, continued um, throughout all of this. Our absence rate remains low. We're still getting excellent quality results. So um, for, for many months, we have been um, number one globally for our quality results of our product. Um, so we've achieved that all but one month in the last 12 months. Um, and we came second on that month. We're slightly gutted. We didn't make all 12 months of that one. Associate retention remains stable. It's very low. Um, and our associate engagement levels remain good. We did a uh, temperature check pulse survey in uh, February 2020 and we're planning to do um, another one in November um, and here's just a couple of highlights so um, the first one seven out of ten of our associates said that they can feel motivated to do the best job they can um, from now until closure well-being 77 percent have given that they feel that the uh, business cares about their well-being and 79 percent feel proud to work for the business even though it is closing so um whilst um i'm sure everybody um can recognize and some of these things will resonate um, with you i'm really quite happy to take some questions or provide any further clarification thank you thanks julie that's a great story so th thank you very much for for sharing that so i guess one, one follow-up question um your your situation is is 
quite unique in that uh, there's a very long lead time between announcing the closure and, and this actually happening. And, and not only that, but you had to maintain production quality standards. And obviously you've, you've managed to achieve that. You know, the results uh, kind of speak for themselves. How, how did you how did you do that? What sort of things did you put in place to, to maintain the engagement of critical um, employees that, that you, you couldn't afford to lose if you were going to continue um, you know, production at the, the, the levels that, that, that you were? Yeah, I think the um, the level of commitment and uh, motivation of the associates at HUM has always been very positive and very high. People are very committed and very proud to work for the organisation. And there's an element of we're not going to let that, you know, so it's driven from the associate population, they're not going to let that drop into closure. They feel very proud and they want to continue with that. Um, there's been financial um, um, elements to that as well. So um, in the um, initial stages, there was um, some retention bonuses um, just to support and keep people in place whilst the uh, consultation was ongoing um, and also the um, negotiation of the redundancy package. So um, there was an element of that financial piece that I think increasing the leadership visibility was certainly one of those um, and having the briefing the regular communication with all of the associates so um, one of the things that that that's quite hard for us to do is communicate to the production associates who are working on shift. Um, they're very busy. We produce, you know, at the time of announcement, we were producing a car every 69 seconds. It's slightly less than that now, but um, every 69 seconds. So um, very tight um, deadlines for them to work to. So stopping the line is a big deal for us. We, you know, as an organization, it, it, it costs money, but we stopped the line to make sure that we could communicate to associates and make sure that they fully understood what was going on and what the next steps were so we did that on a very regular basis to stop the line and make sure that we invested giving that time to the associates and I think that made a really big difference. Okay um, specific question in terms of uh, leadership visibility C can you share just some some specific examples? Yeah so um, interestingly in the lead up to the announcement obviously many of the leadership team were aware of the proposal from Japan and that resulted in a drop in leadership visibility and um, in one of our an normal annual um, surveys um, that was picked up and the uh, the actions that we took was a very simple one of walking the floor so um, uh, just making sure that people weren't in meetings all the time locked in offices um, were visible on the floor um, we also had had um, uh, increased the communication directly from from the MD so um, in some organizations these are called town halls in, in our in our Japanese world they're called Gemba meetings so the um, so those town hall meetings were happening more regularly there were video uh, videos regularly and posted and again we stopped the line to do that to make sure everybody had the opportunity we increased um, other communication channels as well um, so we introduced um, more direct video contact in some of our um, screens that we have around sites um, we opened up um, some uh, sessions around uh, come and talk you know come and talk to us sessions and people could drop in if they wanted to so a number of different things but the key one was just that visibility um, on the production on the production floor mm -hmm. okay thank yeah. you and and then um, just just one, one final question um, if we've got time at the end we'll, we'll come back to, to any more that, that come up but uh, lots of interest about the the um, to find out a bit more specific about the resilience training that you offer associates so can you share just a bit more detail around that yeah so we um we introduced we were planning to do this anyway but we um expedited this a little bit um like we did with the mental health first aid um training so the uh, we we've, we've given a number of options so at the time we had a classroom um resilience um course that people could um attend um we've now uh, made that uh, online and we're adding to that um continuing continually um particularly given um lockdown um, around the wellbeing agenda and we're looking to revisit that actually in terms of what else we can do to support that but essentially it's a uh, self-learning at the moment that people can access um, because of the COVID situation um, and our mental health Thursday trainers have been um, uh, uh, all given that training as well so they can then offer that support on um, managers there was a specific manager program as well okay that's great. Thank you, Julie. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure everyone will find that incredibly useful. But again, very practical. So re really appreciate you, you sharing that story. We, we've sort of zoomed into a, a particular case study. We're going to zoom back out again and, and talk a bit more generally um, about uh, the, the, the characteristics, the practices that set apart organizations that manage these kind of processes really well. So JC, I'd like to hand over to you just to, perhaps you can share some observations across your clients, across the work that you do around uh, what, what does good look like in this context? And I guess one question in particular, perhaps to, to touch on if you can is, um, you know, we, we're all having to do these things virtually at the moment. Um, so, you know, any, any sort of key insights around, you know, how, how do you manage this sort of process when you can't bring people into, you know, the sort of uh, facility that, that Honda has in, in the factory there? Yeah, thanks, Gillian. And, you know, on the outplacement side in terms of virtual delivery, that's really easy to do. So Julie gave an example of kind of an on-site career center, but of course, you know, we're working with thousands of companies across the UK and, and across the globe. And that can be done, you know, virtually. It can be done on our our sites when they're open. They can be done in, in a variety of offices. Um, so, um, when Jillian asked me to participate in this seminar this summer, and I really, we, I think we all started to look at what was likely to happen in terms of redundancies in the UK and, and what's happening in a scary way globally. We thought, you know, it's a really timely time to really be thinking about what best practice we can share with companies who are going into a restructuring. And, and some of you may not have done this in the past 10 or 20 years um, and are now going into it. Some, some of you may be doing redundancies every year, so you're, you're used to it. So what I've been doing over the last month is I've been asking some of our core clients as I've been meeting with them and said, you know, what advice would you share to this forum in terms of things that you wish you had known or had done better or things that you think that you're doing really well. And I you know, committed to, to share those um, with, with you in this, in this meeting. Um, so lots of themes came across. Um, one of the themes that came across uh, very strongly um, in terms of lessons learned is that if you're looking to do say outplacement program or any of the kind of offers that Ian talked about that you can give to people, it's really important that the HR team is aligned with the finance team right at the beginning of the analysis of the, of the, the, the process, because those extras, including outplacement, are only a very small fraction, generally, of the entire severance package. But if it's not part of the financial planning done by the CFO from the very beginning, after the fact, it has to come out of operations expense, and that is nearly impossible. So what um, one of my clients said, make sure people really understand that if you want to, say, offer outplacement, to get those costs into the financial planning that might often be off balance sheet or in a, treated in a different way in your P&L, um, and then it's very affordable. If you wait until after, and that hasn't been part of the planning, there won't be money for that at all. So that was, that was one tip. Um, Second tip, and I think this has to do with, um, I, it's interesting, I was expecting Ian to give a much more forceful legal um, read on, you know, um, here's, here's what's required legally in the communications that you give. And that was an interesting tip that I got from one person who said, one CHRO who said, they wish that they had been more, um, Yes, you have to have those conversations with employees in a very legally structured way to avoid the company getting into trouble. But what they felt like they hadn't done is given enough bandwidth or training to managers delivering messages to be compassionate to the employee as they're delivering the message. And what they said compassion means, it doesn't mean jumping ahead or anticipating what the, um, what the person is going through. It just meant taking time to ask the question and listen. So no response, but not anticipating, not saying, oh, well, you're close to retirement, so that will be easy for you. Or, oh, I know you have a spouse that works, so this will be easier. Or I worry that you're in a bad situation and this is gonna be harder. Not giving managers tips, not to communicate towards the employee, but giving time to listen. And that was, that came across a lot from our, um, 
from the people that I talked to and saying, wishing that they had given managers more instruction on how to just make people feel better um, at the time, just by listening, not by saying anything. And I thought that was a good one. Um, Ian talked a lot and Julie did as well about how some initial reactions are people are in, they're angry, they're in denial. Um, so the very first communication is the thing that needs to be planned the best to start the process of um, having people acknowledge why it happened and not be angry at the company. Um, I think if you are able to offer outplacement, that is the next stage in the development process. So there's a lot of people that come to us um, who are angry, upset, scared, um, and being able to come to a third party and talk to a coach, um, we find very quickly they start to go get out of that anger because they see redundancy happens to a lot of people. Um, it's not just the company, their company making a mistake or, or doing something wrong. Um, but we, we do see people transition very quickly from this anger and frustration to kind of hope in looking towards what's next and what's, what's in the future. Um, so I think that is, is something that's, that's provided. Um, the next tip that I got is um, some HR, one HR lead said they were so focused on the redundancy <clears throat> and the pain that they were going to have to go through that they didn't spend enough time on the survivors. So those people that were going to be left behind. And they said right from the beginning, as they were looking at this pain of the redundancy, they wanted they realize that what they should have done at that same time is already starting to think about the people that are left behind. So, <clears throat> so they said, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so in terms of how to do that, it's recognizing we've done some research that shows that those left after a redundancy have a 40% drop in morale and a 20% drop in productivity. And that's, right when you need them, you're a leaner organization, you need them to be more productive than ever. And I think it's taking the time to um, start to sell the new vision to the remaining people um, so that they are empowered. I do think that's another, another place that outplacement works because if people know that their colleagues are being taken care of, if managers who have to deliver the message feel like there's something to help people land on their feet, I think that's um, that can make a difference, and it does. Sounds like I'm a, an evangelist for um, for outplacement, and, and I am. I think when I was, you know, I was an executive for 20 years and had never heard of outplacement. I'm embarrassed to say, and we made redundancies without it. Um, once I realized how affordable it was, we immediately started doing it, and uh, and I'm, I became the CEO of this company because I believe in it so much. Um, so another uh, another conversation I had was about voluntary redundancy. So when I talked to you know, many CHROs and companies, they, some companies have only offered voluntary redundancy up until now. They've always had an agreement with their union that will always be a voluntary redundancy. Some are now having to go for the first time ever to compulsory redundancy. And there's a question about how to do voluntary redundancy right, and we've, we've written some pieces on that, so I won't go into it here. But one company said they wished that they had offered outplacement with voluntary redundancy. So they had this um, myth that because people chose um, to leave and they chose the package, that they didn't need anything else. And in one case, a company had a, a senior employee who had taken the redundancy package but then nine months later didn't have a job and was bad mouthing the company and its brand, even though they had voluntarily chosen to take it. And I think the challenge is employees don't know what they're getting into. Um, if they haven't searched for a job in five years, the job search process has entirely changed as you, know, you guys know. Um, and how you go about landing your next role is, um, is, is, is gonna be a lot more difficult than they thought. Um, most of the, clients that we're talking to now are saying, um, especially during COVID, they're very worried about the economy and they're very worried about the, the job prospects that they're sending people into and they wanna give them the best support they can during this time, which I think is, is very compassionate. Um, 
I do, as I get to talk to HR leads and, and see the internal workings of companies all over the UK, I'm incredibly impressed at how well um, HR departments manage their employees and are, are every day working with compassion and intelligence and strategically to create a really good um, employee experience. And um, I think it, it's just delightful to look at. And I think what HR departments are feeling now across the country is a real fear and fatigue and sadness um, about what is happening now and what they anticipate is going to be happening in the next six months. Um, so I think another thing that that the companies are doing is offering their HR teams resilience sessions so that, you know, you're, because there's a, a very strong um, risk of your HR department becoming very burned out um, and having, you know, real compassion fatigue problems because of the enormity of what they're dealing with. And a lot of companies for the first time are having to let go really strong trusted workers who have, you know, might have worked for them for 10 or 20 years. And so it's, it's really, really painful. Well, I have some more tips, but I do want to make sure that we have a chance to get to some questions. And, and if we get a chance, I'll, I'll convey some of those other tips that people gave me along the way. Hmm. Thanks, JC. That, that's, that's great. And um, we, we've got one question around, um, specifically around outplacement. And um, at what point does it make sense to, to raise awareness on this? So the specific question was around, uh, is, is there sense in, in, in raising awareness before redundancies are actually announced or, you know, it's, it's obvious that, that they're happening. I mean, obviously there's a risk there of setting hairs running by, by starting to talk about outplacement, but you know, what would your advice be around the, the right sort of timing of raising awareness? Yeah, I mean, we find most companies prepare a lot in advance and inform managers. They tend to raise awareness population-wide at the time an announcement is made, whether it's made in the press or there's a signal that something's coming um, because they don't, they don't, you're right, they don't want to, um, you know, make the, the employee population afraid before an announcement is made. But if it's made immediately upon um, the communication of that, I think that makes a big difference to, um, to help people feel like the company's gonna do whatever they can to support and to signal that. I mean, one of a, one company we worked with said, look, our, their severance package was tremendously generous, um, but they said, actually, well, all the outplacement was just a fraction of the cost. It's the thing that made the biggest difference to the employees and feeling like they were being cared for. So some, you know, people think, you know, companies have endless pockets of money um, and so they think, oh, well, you know, you've given us the money, you know, but that didn't, that didn't mean anything. And it, I think it has to do with, I think something that Julie said is like, not just saying you care, but showing you care. Um, and I think through the different support services that you offer, whether it's outplacement or the things that Ian mentioned, that's where you have the opportunity to do that. Um, I'll tell you, when you first communicate the, the, outplacement service, people won't know what it means, they won't value it, they won't understand it. It's what we generally find, it's when we come on site and we actually explain to people what they're getting at the time that they know they're being made redundant, that's when they understand the value that it's gonna bring. Yeah, okay, Thank, thanks, JC. I, I think just before, we've, we've got a couple of minutes before we do to finish, but I, I would like to bring us back to talking about um, the employees who, who are left behind and, and you know, to pick up on your point, JC, about the, the um, drop in engagement and the, this feeling of trauma that perhaps people, people ha are, are left as a hangover from, from these um, experiences. So just briefly, any top tips in terms of, of dealing with that? And I'd also it'd be good if, if, um, if we still have Steve, Steve Buck from Glint on the call as well. I might want to just add a comment as, as well in terms of maintaining engagement. You know, are there practical um, steps that, that we can take to, to think about those who, who are left behind? Um, I think my top two tips are, yes, resilience training. Um, and then I think it's laying the new vision. So I know it's difficult to lay an exciting new vision when you're seeing your colleagues be let go, but I think helping, helping um, employees understand that redundancy isn't just a cost-cutting measure, it's making the company lean for a 
to start to grow in a strong future. And the sooner that you can put together that vision, I think the more it gets people um, thinking about change and transformation rather than just the pain part of redundancy. Mm. And it's back to leadership, visibility and, and communication uh, is, is absolutely essential. Yeah. Steve, any thoughts to add to that? Yeah, sure, Gillian. And, and um, you mentioned we we're all doing this flexibly earlier on. Yes, I am sitting in the back of my car in case there's any, any doubt about that. Um, so, Glint, we've, we've now got to six, 7 million data points that we've been measuring since the, the beginning of the pandemic, which is solely surrounding our clients that are, that are surveying their employees. But at the beginning of the pandemic and now looking at things like post furlough and looking at the end of redundancies and layoffs, as we've been talking about today. And um, we've definitely seen... Um, a big big decrease in the amount of connection that people are feeling we've talked a lot about that today um, but that's in terms of top tips in terms of people who have been left behind um, really the main thing is get the insights if you're not asking them you're you're relying on gut feel or um, or speculation at, at, at very very best um, get the insights to help you make those decisions uh, the next thing is build the right habits. So um, get, helping people get into the habits of having conversations with employees, sometimes around potentially things that might be quite emotional in nature. Um, a lot of HR people have focused in the past around um, really really only talking about KPI driven conversations and now we're trying to shift it so that managers are able and upskilling to ask about things like how are you doing how can I support you at this time um, and with that in mind then one of the things that we've really found from our research is that helping people set effective goals and prioritize their work particularly if we're seeing increased workload as, as, the, as the layoffs really start to bite um, but also for, not to not to forget about things like learning and growth so we know from any engagement survey that that learning and developments and career opportunities is a huge driver of engagement and a huge driver of retention in organizations as you've now as organizations have now i guess selected the people that are staying um however that that might have been it's very very important not to treat them as a commodity anymore they'll be feeling very vulnerable as we've heard from a number of people today and focusing on their career opportunities, their learning and development is going to be critical to bringing that sense of connection back on board. So, um, yeah, I've never I've never done those tips in, in two minutes before. So hopefully that's uh, condensed enough for you in the, well, in the interest well of time. Done, well done, Steve. Steve, thanks very much for that. Just to say, we will be sending some other materials uh, with the, the notes from this call. So including some top tips from 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 Steve at, at Glint and, um, and other relevant materials. So. We've had a flood of questions just as we as we come up to the top of the hour. Unfortunately, we, we're out of time, but um, thank you so much for, for your engagement on the call, um, for all your questions, and a huge vote of thanks to, um, to our speakers, Ian, JC, Julie. Um, thank you very much, and uh, we'll be in touch soon with, uh, with the recording and the notes. Thanks, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks Goodbye. so much. Thanks, Bye now. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.